First off, uh, thanks so much for, for joining our session so early in the morning. Uh, as I was telling Maggie, I, I'm always impressed. I've been coming to this show for 20 years, and I'm always really impressed by the people who get here for the 8 o'clock session. Uh, I will say upon times, uh, there have been years where I have gone, you know, that 9 o'clock keynote sounds pretty good, so thank you for coming in early, getting out with us, and getting going early. We appreciate it. We hope to give you a, uh, a good 50 minutes of you know, solid conversations and new tools and hopefully some new ideas. Um, with that, we're going to keep going. And, and I don't know. Am I loud enough? Can you guys hear me? Because this would be my normal way. I'm, do you need me to do no, this you, for, for the mic? Can. Okay. And then if you want to do it, feel free. But I, I was never aware of application in a space like this because I project pretty good um, most of the time. So, this is our friendly disruption for the day. So we're going to start just doing a couple of introductions. The one low-tech thing we did is we forgot our clicker. So we're going to have to do the old-fashioned walk over and have someone drive. So I'm going to introduce Maggie first and she'll tell you a little bit about herself, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and we'll get rolling right into this. So. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, so Craig is a lifer at this conference, and I'm a first-timer. Yay. Now, uh, my, name is, my name is Maggie I'm actually a certified speech language pathologist. Um, the last few years I've specialized in assistive technology. Um, and uh, the last well, the last few years um, I've been at the Iowa Department of Education um, as their accessibility coordinator. And just this last year I started with the Cedar Rapids Community School District doing the exact same thing. I missed being on the ground um, working closer with teachers and students. And so um, I even need that shared better a little closer to the classroom. Um, I'm excited to be here today. My wheelhouse is special education and, and creating accessible learning environments for kids. Um, and it's um, Thanks, Maggie. So, um, maybe about a year ago, <coughs> this is the great thing about this. Really. So, about a year ago, you want to just yeah. start that again? About a year ago, uh, I met Maggie. Uh, I uh, am a technology director of all things, but before that I was an English teacher. Um, and I know it's a weird mix. Uh, I've been doing uh, the tech thing for uh, about 20 years. I'm with college community schools. I've been in that same position. This will be starting my 19th year. It seems impossible to believe that. Um, but I'm also... Uh, thanks, Maggie. If you want to just... Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm going to through. Okay. So this topic today is really, really close and near and dear to my heart. You hear kind of my three reasons right here. My oldest is starting at UNI this fall. Um, kind of grab average every day kid. My, my middle child is a junior at Prairie. Uh, he's kind of an interesting cat. It, it's hard to see in this picture, but he's actually holding a guitar. I just made the best thing I've done in the last five years. I bought him a, a guitar this summer, got him off the PlayStation on the guitar, which my wife is not making this so I've done in the last five years. But, uh, he's making his dad proud about playing guitar more than he's playing video games. But my youngest is Cohen, and he's 10 years old. And Cohen, if you can tell, he's in, he's in a mobility appliance. Uh, he doesn't walk, talk, feed himself. He's, he's, he's uh, a developmentally challenged person. And so I've had the opportunity to kind of get involved in special ed a little deeper uh, in my career because of that over the last few years. Now. What we're going to talk about today really doesn't directly impact Cohen all that much. He does use a lot of assistive tech, but I'm thinking more about our other kids. Thanks, Maggie. That was a little loud. Um, by the way, Cohen is an interesting story. We'll talk more about him in a little bit. But uh, his name is spelled K-O-A-N, which is, if you, it's kind of pretentious, but uh, we named him for, this, for the Zen riddle. If you're familiar with that, it's a riddle that, that Zen monks meditate on, and it's an answerless riddle oftentimes. So the sound of a, the uh, a really famous code is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Now the good news is, is that it's an answerless riddle, but it leads to enlightenment. And that's kind of the way we think about Cohen. We don't know why he is the way he is, but he, he is. He's, he's been a great blessing in our lives. So with that, I want to kick right into the, the real meat of this. What we'd like to do is we're going to try to be as interactive as we can today. Uh, I am absolutely passionate about assistive technology, making sure it's out there for all kids, not just kids like Cohen, but my older two as well. Um, what I'd like you to do, we may have to get up and move around a little bit today. I know that's a, a big engagement strategy. I also know it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Maybe many of us are trying to get our coffee in, so bear with us. So what I'd like you to do first, I'm not going to ask you to move right now, but if you can see the three pictures up here, I'd like you to make sure you're in proximity with somebody else, maybe a couple of someone's. Have a look at these. Read the text underneath each one, 
And then let's have a conversation for the next couple of minutes about these two problems. First of all, do you agree with the overall premise? Second, what are the barriers to implementing that chain link model in our current school system? So let's take, I don't know, two minutes. Have a conversation. A read and have a conversation. And because I'm a universal design person, I'm going to read out loud if you don't want to listen Thank to you, me plug your ears. The first image. In the first image, it is assumed that everyone will benefit from the same supports. They are being treated equally. Okay? The second image. Individuals are given different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access. They are being treated equitably. And then the third image, all three can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of inequity was addressed. And the systemic barrier has been removed. So that's more of a universal design. You can you track Maggie. It's a better move. I'll try. I know. Really, really interesting. Is that 
because of my son Cohen, I got, uh, I'm on the State Special Ed Advisory Panel for the DE here in Iowa. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I, that's where I met Maggie. I saw her at a, at a conference we attended with that group. And I had this sort of revelatory moment where I had that exact sort of thing where I was like, oh my gosh, I've been doing my job for 16 years now and I'm doing it wrong. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, to me, the, here, here's, here's kind of my mental model on this. Something like 70 percentage of the school districts in Iowa have some sort of one-to-one -one initiative somewhere. That's the chain link fence right there. There are so many things we can and should be doing that are really not hard. It's kind of low-hanging fruit, frankly, that we can really get this thing moving forward because we've got the pieces in place already. So what we're talking about here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you, there are some of you who know a lot. We could do a whole session on this, but I just want to give you kind of a, the next few slides are going to be sort of a conceptual framework about some of the things we're going to dig into here in a second. But basically, the, the idea behind that, the philosophy behind this, and Maggie Fine, you're not one of I'll jump in. Uh, is, is called uh, Universal Design for Learning, UDL. And it basically is around three principles of engagement, representation, and expression. And it's about giving students the ability to, to have some different ways of doing all of those things. And that's how we start getting the mindset involved on how you might make a shift to identifying where the, where the fences are and then actually the actionable steps about how we're going to address these things. And again, this is, in my mind, this is about all kids. This isn't about our special ed kids. Now, they're going to benefit a lot from this, but this, everybody's going to get a huge push on this. And so we can do a whole session on UDL, but it's just that's, if you want to go deeper, we'll put some, we'll, we've got some uh, references that you can come back to and learn more of. And, and while well, he's flipping the slides, what UDL also does is it allows us to address those things that are legally required for, for students on IEPs. Um, while hosting and supporting a, a whole host of, of student need in the in the you know in the breadth and depth of, of our learner need. Um, but that being said, can't say it loud enough, can't say it big enough. This is not about special education. Okay, we kind of have talked about this as as, as the kids will most benefit from it. And the saying I always use, and I borrowed from somebody else, I stole from somebody else. When we talk about things like this, it's essential for some kids, but it's good for all of them. Okay. This will be written on my tombstone and read <laughs> So again, just some terminology here that you may have seen. We're going to just get a flash by this really fast. Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, you'll see terminology called AEM or accessible educational materials or accessible instructional materials. Um, they're really sort of two pieces of the same pie. Uh, the AEM pie is the big whole. The AIM is AIM, it's just a piece of it. And again, this is more for your reference later, but in case you ever get dragged into these conversations, AEM is all about compliance with, this, with an IEP. AEM, did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, AEM <laughs> is very broad. It's that sort of, this is good for all kids conversation. And this is how I think about myself as a practitioner. You know, I let the special ed people take care of the AIM stuff. I want to make sure we've got all the pieces in place for that. But as a district leader, I want to address AEM for all of our kids all the time. And that's a pretty big elephant to start chowing down on. But it is important to understand. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I know, okay, which is prayer. Um, Cedar Rapids Prairie is the district I'm from. We're, we're a suburban school district in southwest Cedar Rapids. It serves about 6,000 kids. Uh, we have a strategic plan, which I put up there, which has four sort of main goals. But before we even get to that, it's critical to know that our mission's vision, you know, sort of the thing that drives the whole animal, is very simple. It's three words. Success for all. It's our vision. It has been for, since before I've been there, and I've been with Prairie 19 years. Uh, so when we talk about success for all, it comes in right there on our strategic plan down there at the bottom. We also have this section under goal one, which is our first focus is we believe all kids can learn at high levels. And we actually put language in there that I circled, and it says this, and we're serious about this, all means all. So when we look at my son Cohen, 
We're talking about trying to get him to achieve as much as he possibly can in his situation. The way we're going to do this, and we've committed this four years ago now, so we're four years into a 10 year plan and it's getting kind of scary. We're going to do it through creating a personalized learning system. And this is where AEM gets really interesting. Because by 2024 25, we hope to have a fully operational, personalized learning environment for all of our kids. In quantity, even at year six years out, we're not quite sure what that looks like. I've got to be honest. We're getting closer. But I can tell you one thing, and I've hit this home with our staff repeatedly, time after time after time after time. While it's not the totality, AEM is one of the ways that personalized learning manifests itself. It's one of the ways we give voice, choice, and power and agency to our kids. So when a kid sits down and says, you know what, I'm going to learn that better if I listen to it rather than read it, and we're not talking about teaching reading, we're talking about consuming content, we need to shift the mindset of our staff to say, go for it, do it. And so we've aggressively started a plan to do that over the next five or six years. And we're hopefully we're going to make some real progress in the next couple. So this is, um, this is Cedar Rapids mission and, and, and vision there in the center. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm relatively new to the district, but this is really new to me. Um, they actually worked through, um, unlike Prairie, um, who's had their kind of vision in place for quite some time, we actually just changed ours. Um, and our new vision is every learner future ready. Um, I think probably if, if we um, tallied up the number of missions in the, in the, in the room right now, every district would have either the word all or every. Um, sometimes as a special educator, I kind of cringe at that word because um, historically in my experience, we're maybe not addressing every. But like Craig said, with a few tweaks and changes, we can take what we're addressing the majority and truly, truly be talking about every or all learners. Um, and so our mission is that every learner is going to be future ready. What does that mean? Well, we're working on the definition of future ready. Um, but we know that there are components, we know that there are components that are going to go into that, right? Um, and so this puzzle piece kind of works through some of that. Um, and actually Craig's colleague, my colleague, um, she kind of led this process. And there are um, six puzzle pieces. And as you think about a district, this is really kind of components um, that we should be addressing, but some, some of them sometimes get left off. Um, two that I want to highlight, well actually I want to highlight all of them, the red one is equity. This isn't about, equi about equity and, and things being equitable to all people. Um, innovation, we're talking about personalized learning. And when we can personalize learning, not just for most, but for all or every learner, um, then we're really kind of taking a step closer. Um, and then culture and climate. Um, I think like you were touching on, this is sometimes when we think about accessibility or aim for all and, and having things accessible for all, um, telling a student, yes, you can use um, a text-to-speech tool on this test. It's okay, even though you don't have an IEP. What? That's a big shift in mindset. Historically, we've been um, you know, thinking from, oh, only those kids get that, those supports. Um, but we're really shifting into a time here in the 21st century where if you need that support to be successful and to meet your standards, let's do it. Let's give it to you. Um, and so these are, it's a culture and climate thing, right? It's a mindset shift. So there are a lot of components that go into kind of getting this message out, getting this work out. Um, and I think it can all start with a mission and a vision of a district. So we're, 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 we're hitting kind of the philosophy right here kind of hard. And I, now, I almost want to apologize to that because I know you came here to get tools. But at the same time, I guess the, the overarching point of this is, is that if you don't really believe it and have it in your institution's DNA, that's the first step. That's the first tool. If you don't start there, it's going to be superficial. Okay? And that's a really big kind of essential understanding if we're thinking about it from an instructional design standpoint. So here's some interconnections. Yeah. So, so I, um, just a, as an example of that systemic component I think that Greg was just talking about, if it's not built into what you're already doing, that might be um, one of your initial first steps. And so what I've illustrated here is this, this is our leadership structure in our district. Um, and what I know is that I'm working very closely with every single one of those people every week to ensure that every step that they take and every step that I'm taking 
is coming toward the same common goal. All right? So I'm going to take you through our plan in prayer. And this is where it's going to start getting nuts and bolts. It starts getting real right away. So we've identified three big chunks that we're going to start addressing. We've already started on all three of these. First of all, we're going to handle how we procure new materials. We're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So how do we bring new stuff, new curriculum materials into the district? We're going to talk about how do we handle the existing materials that we've got. So we know we've got stuff in the district that's not accessible. So what do we do about that? Three, how do we start changing mindsets, giving people the tools to make this actually happen? So how does the work actually happen? So it's three, big, three of those big things. Procurement. This is a huge thing, okay? And this is the the overriding understanding I make to our all of our folks, our, from our superintendent to our curriculum people, all the way down to our to our building principals, our department leads, our PLC leads, everybody. We need to be very very serious about this. If we can't ensure that the material is going to be accessible in multiple formats, and we're going to talk about what that means here in just a second. We have to say no. It's like building a new building that's not ADA compliant. You would not build a new building in your district that didn't have ramps or ways for kids to get around, who couldn't move around in a normal way. This is, it, that's black and white. And I don't see the world in very many black and whites, but this is one of those things. And so far, through our district, we've had that conversation. We've said, if it doesn't meet these standards, we're not buying it. And that gives us the ability to put pressure on things. And we've already seen some changes. In ADA 10, they bought FOS kits. Grant Wood, and I'm not going to bash on Grant Wood. They do great things there. But I will put a little bit of pressure on them. They bought FOS science kits that were not accessible for all learners. We said, unacceptable. <coughs> Fix it. You know what? We're getting there. We got movement on that for the first time this fall because of this purchasing protocol that we drafted out, and I'll show it to you right here just real quick. We're not going to run through it, but I just want to make you aware that, that we've actually got one. So here's, here it is. This is our purchasing protocol at Prairie. Now the big question is, okay, first of all, we we're going to say the two things we really got on there are this. It has to be two standards, and, and we've given you, we'll, we're not going to bog you now with the standards. You can learn about those on your own and put resources for them. But we said everything must meet the NEMAS standard, which is a sign impaired one. And then we said everything must be, meet the WCAG standards, which are the standards for web accessibility. Okay? And you can dig into those. We put links to this in the presentation at the end if you really want to dig into them. But we've given this policy out and we've got to sort of work through the process. And I just want to just show you we've got we'll flow charts, everything here, and how this looks. When we start examining curriculum, and more importantly, when we actually start talking to vendors about buying. Now, the main thing here is that it's all well and good to have a policy, but we got to teach it. We need to make sure everybody in the district, every teacher, every secretary, every principal, every curriculum person, people like me, it's the interconnectedness that Maggie was talking about, we get that. We all have to be on board. That's why that mission vision stuff is so critical. Because if someone goes, you know what, but it's really good. And if we don't do it, what are we going to do? you got to stick to your guns, because that's where you get it. That's the hill you're willing to die on if you've got the mission and vision set up. So we've got all this sort of stuff going on. By the way, we've got all sorts of other big conversations happening, really interesting ones about library collections. I also oversee the, the teacher librarians in our district. That's a really interesting conversation right now. They're on board. I mean, I've got all of them fired up and ready to go, but it's a resources question, right? How do you start managing that conversion? How do you start thinking about it differently? So this is a really rich area. So I'd love, I'm just, while you're switching that again, um, not only is this the best thing to do for all kids, but it is a legal requirement for those kids on IEPs. So this kind of stuff should already be in your, in your purchasing protocol. If it's not, another great place to start. So we're gonna get you up and move. Yeah, circle of influence. Come on up here, put your things down. Yep, step we're gonna get kind of close. Um, this is not, I, I, I apologize, this is really early in the morning, but I think what this activity that we're gonna do, come on up here, Robin, I'm gonna circle up here. Um, I think this activity is really important and to start having these conversations about procurement um, and about um, system work 
in, in your district, in your school, wherever it is that you may be. Um, so form a circle. Yep. And everybody in the circle. So we're going to do this quick. Okay. So as you're forming a circle, and I'm not going to be in a circle, so I'll get the whole circle. Um, okay. So as you're forming this circle, you are now not you. You are a part of your district. You might be a teacher. No, you're not. You might be a textbook, you might be a procurement um, process, you might be um, a te technology, like a Chromebook. You're all a piece of a system, okay? And you have to connect with you and another person in order for the system to work, right? So I can't, a Chromebook, what's a Chromebook without a tool to use on that Chromebook, right? Okay, so um, everybody here has to connect to two different people in this room. So you're, you're not yourself anymore. You're just a piece of the system. So find two other pieces in the system, and you are going to stay in a minute equidistant from that person, that part of the system. Okay? You don't have to touch them. You don't need to be right next to them, right? Um, but you need to kind of keep them sort of. You guys are okay. So I'm equidistant from you. I'm also equidistant from you here, right? Um, so this is the process. Everybody's going to choose two people and stay equidistant. All right? We're going to start that. Everybody figure out who you're going to stay equidistant from. Get it in your head. Your two parts of your system. Uh, before I leave the circle, you guys start. Um, you know, standing on chairs. Please watch the um, the uh, projector here. Please go. No. Please go equidistant.
we're going to have our third meeting a week from tomorrow. So this is how fast this is moving and evolving. But when you're excited, when you're when you're when you see something that really is easy and can be done, you can absolutely make a big dent. So I told you there are three parts. We talked about the first one. The second part, and we're going to kind of ramp this up because I want to make sure we get to all of our content, is conversion. And this is another rich area. So one of the things we're concerned about is, let's say, and I, and I forgot to bring this, so I just grabbed some stuff from the vendor shelf. You got material like this, you go, how do I get this accessible for kids who might want to listen to this, rather than have an adult sit down and read with them? And so we did some studying, and there's a lot of things we got to do differently. But, thanks, Greg. Okay, so one of the things we did is we got, we got a ton of iPads that are in this. These iPad minis are cheap, relative, 250 bucks. So we went out and found uh, and worked with our ADA team. I just kind of bashed on Wrightwood, but they've been dynamite partners for us. And I said, I, want, I got this problem. What do we want to do? And so I met Julie Free and Kelly Robertson. They came over for a couple of days and we talked about it. And we, we settled on an app called Prisma, which we'll link in here in a minute, which is a $10 app. If you buy if you buy 100 of them, you get it half off, or 100 bucks on it, you get it half off. So if you spend $200, you get 20 of them. Um, it's super, super easy to use. So it'll convert that document in just a flash of an eye to a, to a text-ready PDF, one that's OS, o, OCR, and it'll do it slick. So, and, and then you can just email it right off. So basically, all you do, and I wish I could, I, I thought about bringing my dongle and I didn't. So I'll hold it up and show it to you. No, I don't want to write a review. Is it just looks like this. I'm going to click the camera button right there. It's going to access my camera. We're going to put it down on the. I'm going to get down tight. I'm going to say if I can get a good picture of it. I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm going to hit done. There's the document I just took. I hit the word recognize right there. It scans it. And there it is. Done. Do you think kids could do this? That's our vision, is that we're going to put these in every media center. We're going to put a few in strategic uh, department areas. And we hope to put these around in places where kids can come up and just go, you know what, I'd rather listen to that. Done. Now, it doesn't address everything. Certainly, <laughs> there's lots of complex problems here for, from you know, where do we store that stuff in terms of how does it fit in with the learning management system? It's sort of some of that, that circle of influence conversation again. What do we do about things like copyright? Well, certainly we have some latitude as educators, but there are some things we can't just go click, 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 click and do it with impunity. And it doesn't work very well, frankly, for documents that you want to scan if you had a novel. That would take a long time to do. But if you just got the one-off sheet, it is dynamite. It is absolutely almost bulletproof. Is and anybody I, working in a Windows environment? Because yeah. there are very similar types of things. We have um, Office Lens does the exact same type of thing. So if you have any Windows type tablets or, or books, it does the same type of thing. Get a whole new later and you know, walk through some of that. So yeah, this is just I just want to give you one example of how you can start eating this element. That's an that's an analogy I'm going to use a lot. It's kind of gross, but you get the <laughs> idea, right? I mean, this is a big problem. You just got to start chunking away at it. And the old adage is, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> so, all right. This is what happens when the tech director tries to walk the talk and use a six-year-old PC to to see what his staff can do. And all right. Finally, the third the third piece, and this is really kind of the egg in the omelet for me in some ways. Okay. You need to start teaching your staff how to do this, right? Okay, the first thing we did was, and we had, we had sort of a confluence of activity here, and in all likelihood, I should have brought along our uh, student services director, Cheryl Kibbers, who oversees our special ed department, because she got us involved with DE, and this is kind of also where Peggy and, and my paths crossed again, um, is we got to be part of an AT, Assistive Tech Usability Study for Specially Designed Instruction, SDI. And so we bought Google Read and Write, because we're a Google school, we have been for years and years and years, for all of our kids. And we bought that through that state grant. What we found out was it was kind of one of those deals where it was just pure happenstance, where we were targeting that one building, 
and we got the quote from Textile, who sells Read and Write, and to cover that building, which has about 900 kids, we said it was going to be quite a bit. I mean, it was seven, eight thousand dollars. And we said, well, how much to do the whole district? And they're like, oh, you want a site license? We're like, yeah. They're like, no, it's the same. <laughs> We're like, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. So we bought it for everybody. We've had it for everybody for years. So that's our weapon of choice. Now it is not perfect. It doesn't do everything we want to do. It doesn't address a lot of the hearing impairment stuff. It, you know, there, there's so many things it doesn't do, but there are so many things it does do. Again, it's like, where do you take the first bite of the elephant? This is it. So we've planted our flag with read and write. Now, you don't have to go there. There's lots of other tools you can choose, but that's our weapon of choice. So our way of doing this is to provide highly contextualized PL for our leaders. And I don't just mean principals, I mean all of our instructional leaders. And that's something we're underway with right now, this very instant. In fact, I think there's a joint cadre meeting going on, probably like right now, back at Prairie, where they're walking the talk on this, which is all of our teacher leaders. Because what we're trying to get them to see is, it's the same process we had when we implemented the Google Tool Suite back in 2007, 10 years ago. We didn't have to give a lot of PL on Google Fox. We just had to show people the tools and get a few key people using it. People went, oh, well, this is really handy. And then they just started using it. And that's really the same organic model we're hoping to have happen here. And we're trying to drive all the way down into what we hope are the, the, the really difference maker groups like PLC. So I'm going to give you some, some examples here. So this is the example we gave out. Actually, I'm going to let Maggie talk about multi-tiered system of support. Thank you, you're first. And then I'll show you the, the PL that I, that I led for our oversight team, which is our principals, instructional coaches, and uh, other district leaders which embedded this in there. I'm going to just show you basically how we just went bam, 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 and we're right through. So, but go ahead and talk a little bit about this. Well, I slid this around to a different place and it's not fitting now. It's um, okay. <laughs> so this is, the Craig just talked about Iowa Specially Designed Instruction and the, the, the work that they've been doing. Um, and, and I think this is a place, this is common talk, right? This triangle, everybody's familiar with this triangle, right? So when we think about this, typically we think of um, instruction, like small group direct instruction for the yellow and the red, right? But what if we flipped the switch a little bit and thought of this not just as direct explicit instruction for kids in the yellow and the red, um, but as, as our technology supports. So there are things that in the green that we're giving to everybody, right? And in Craig's district, the tools that everybody is getting is very different than in my district that everybody is getting. Um, but then there are tools in the yellow that a, that a group of students might need or might require, right? And then the red are those tools that, that only a few, few students might require. But the trick about it, going back to the circle of influence, is that if you're not making strategic decisions about what we're giving to all kids and how that is, um, supports the red, how that supports those tools that only a few need, then we're going to get into this problem of throwing things into the system and making splashes where it doesn't need to splash, right? And so I think um, Craig walks through this personal uh, professional learning is that that's one, one place where you guys are not just all green all students, green all teachers. And so what, what are, uh, thinking about this triangle just a little bit differently. Yeah, and so what Meg is talking about here is really what Michael Fuller would call one of the key roles of a, a leader is coherence building, making it all fit together so you're not just adding one more thing. And that's really our main goal when we do this, we're trying to build that sense of connectedness, it all fits together. So in our PL, one of the things we did is we start off and we just say, okay, well, here's the Google Rewrite Toolbars <coughs> at this point. It's really easy. You want to know how to do something? Just click there. We leave that up the whole time. We'll move in. And by the way, this is PL on personalized learning. Remember our strategic plan. We're building a personalized learning system, right? That's our goal. So we're having this is what we had to do. We said, hey, hey, hey. we're going to reinforce some names up here. We want you to use the highlight feature in Read and Write. And we want you to read the article. And this is, I love this. This is a great time. I wish I could take credit for it, but it was my, my partner, Cry back at, at Prairie, Brian Reedstrom. We found this article called Don't Personalize Learning, which is a sort of an opposite standpoint, why it's a bad idea to personalize learning, why it's a buzzword. But then we want you to highlight two rebuttal articles in a different highlight. And when you do that with read and write, it collects it and automatically creates a Google Doc, and you can do a write-around with that. 
for a quick ride, and that's what we're going to have to look at. So we had them answer these prompts based upon their highlights. By the way, they could also listen to them. We had them bring earbuds so they could listen to the articles rather than having to read them. We made sure they understood that. And then we had them go through and watch some videos because we want to hit all the sort of senses here. Add that information to the quick right. And then we answered these final two prompts. We had some group discussion about it. We processed it collectively. So we not only got a huge bang for our buck on personalized learning, we increased our understanding of what it means to be personalized and how we can sort of move that thing forward. At the same time, we gave a huge push to Google Rewrite. And by the way, when we've done this, and I've done this with three different groups so far, it's undoubtedly somebody else looks at a different tool than the Read and Write toolbar and goes, oh, the Screen Master. My God, that's really handy. I need to be using this personally all the time. And that's when you know you got it. You got a real day, and it's going to take off and go. And we've seen it happen. I am, I'm not certain of it, but I am going to. But I would bet a large chunk of my next paycheck that we're going to see a huge bump in our implementation metrics mm -hmm. in just the next few weeks based upon these sorts of activities. Like I said, oversight last week, joint cadre uh, this week. Uh, we're going to do our admin learning the following week, and then we'll hit it again in the spring really hard. Every time we process text, we're going to do that. And by the way. When we capture this here, it's, that's what you do, is you email it off, you've got a PDF, and it's ready to go in Google Read and Write. That's the way we're pushing it. That's our method. Is it perfect? No, it's not comprehensive enough, but it's a heck of a good start. All right. So we're coming down to the end, and we want to get some participatory pieces in from you again. Because it, we're going to also share some resources, and we're going to give you an exit ticket before you, you get out the door. But what we'd like you to do is do a little four-corner activity. And I want, you to give, I want to give you about two minutes to think on this first. Maybe 90 seconds. Two minutes is a long time. But think about one of these prompts. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to let Maggie take it. Yeah, so, so <laughs> we, we're, we're going to share some tools next, okay? So we're just going to we're just going to be walking around the room. Yeah, this is out of order, isn't it? Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so we're going to sh sh show some tools in, in the next minute. Um, and after you see that tool, you're going to think to yourself. And if you need to, take a picture of this mobile device so you can reference the... We'll the come back to it. Okay. We'll come back to it. When I get back to my position, I will use this tool in my work. You're going to come stand right up over here. When I get back to my position, I will share this tool with colleagues. When I get back, I will teach my students how to use this tool over in that corner. When I get back over in that corner, I would do nothing with this tool. All right? So use the tool in my work, share with colleagues, uh, teach it to students, and do nothing. Here we go. Do you want to? No, we can, we, we can just, we can take you. All right. So we've got a list of tools. These aren't comprehensive by any means. These are just things that we talked about. We didn't want to overwhelm you either. Um, we talked a little bit about Google Read and Write already. That's what my district uses. That's our weapon of choice. You guys are using? Yes. We're using Read and Write, um, but we're using it for Windows. Okay. Yep. And then Snap and Read is kind of the Don Johnson equivalent to that. It's another screen reader, text reader. Uh, both have word prediction, dictation, all that stuff. Um, Good things. You know somebody more than I do. So. Yeah, and then okay. So Rewordify, Rewordify um, is a uh, website that um, will reduce or change text complexity. So if you've got, say, a fifth grade level text that you found in a website or, or on a worksheet, you copy that text and paste it over into this website that we've given you, and it will. Um, you can change the lexile level, and it will shrink that text. And it's not just um, a summary tool, it literally goes through and it changes um, the text complexity uh, by reducing vocabulary. But Snap and Read has that feature too. Um, I'll do Grammarly. Yes. I love Grammarly. Grammarly is like my favorite thing in the world. Um, there's a free version, that's one we use. We don't pay for this one. Um, it's a great grammar checker. The uh, thing I have to admit I love most about it is it gives you a bi-weekly report on how many words you've read. 
always makes me feel smart. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, it's cool. And it, it also catches a lot of sort of syntax here. One of the things I didn't tell you about myself, and I'll disclose right now, is that when I came through school, uh, I, you know, many, many educators go into education because they're like good at school. I was terrible at school, as, as all the way through my high school career and as an undergraduate. Uh, I'm a dyslexic, so I had trouble reading. I was a non-reader until I was about in 7th or 8th grade. And I still leave out a lot of words when I write. Love to write. Love, love, love to write. I write a lot. In fact, uh, my grammar reports, I write between 15 and 20,000 words a week. I mean, I, I, I write all the time. But Grammarly is like invaluable to me because it catches all those little prepositions and stuff I leave out. And it makes it just really crystal clear that I can see it. It's just the thing I got it. And it's one of those that we push out for all of our kids to the free version. And, and for, for students um, who, who are dyslexic and who are requiring that support, um, it really can be used not only as, as a support, um, but also as an instructional tool. So it, it's a moment for teaching, teachable moments as well. So um, let's see. Chromebox. Chromebox. Chromebox is a um, built-in screen reading tool. So um, for students who are visually impaired, um, they often need screen readers, right? Have you, have you ever heard of JAWS software? Well, um, Google has gotten really accessibility, accessibility friendly, and they've actually developed their own um, their own screen reading tool for the Google Chrome browser called Chromebox. It's really fantastic. Um, Mercury Reader. This is another one. This is another summer, summary tool. Um, so unlike Rewordify, this one actually summarizes text. So if you're needing something quickly, or if your students just don't have the, the, the span to stick with something for a long period of time, um, this will summarize the text. And we're going to just kind of blow through these last few because we want to get to the last piece of activity and we're almost out of time. So we've already talked about Prismo. Duelist is another extension we push out that allows two windows open so kids can have two windows open easily, particularly in a Chrome environment, Chromebooks. By the way, I did mention that we're five, five to nine, one to one Chromebooks, ten to twelve, one to one MacBooks. All of our kids have devices. We use Chrome as our as our main uh, browser for all of our kids, and so this is something we push out. And there's all sorts of built-in stuff, dictionaries, uh, you name it, in, in a Mac and Windows OS, Chrome OS that, that do marvelous things. One of the things we haven't pushed on at all, and I'm going to push on just for a second, we'll hit it again before we leave and we do the four corners, yes. is that Maggie and I, you can tell we're a little passionate about this. We, we kind of like this topic. And so we get together about once a month and put out a podcast called Friendly Disruption. We're going to be doing it here. Um, you can see it's down in the lower corner. Uh, that's our Twitter handle, and we put the address down there. Um, we get interesting people on, by the way. You'll know the keynote. We had him on first. But he was talking to us last month. Uh, we also talked to Kevin Tunnicutt, Kevin Brookhauser, Charlie Cratch, Scott McLeod, and we've talked to all sorts of interesting people. Um, we'll keep doing that. We're looking for teachers, though, to talk to. So if anybody, we have in our exit ticket, if you want to, to be on our podcast, just let us know. We'd love to talk to practitioners because that's really where it happens. So I want to go back and do that yes. four corners activity before we get out of here because I think that's a dynamite way to, to end things. And if you're really gutsy and you want to be on our podcast today, yeah. Come on up and talk to us before you leave. No joke. No joke. <laughs> All right. So um, let's go start with Read and Write for Google. Um, we didn't show you much about it, um, but again, it's it's a it's a literacy tool. Okay, this is something that you might, and this is free for educators. So you as an educator, you can go download this for free and utilize it. Is this something? Do we have time for this? I don't think we have time for it. Okay. I'm sorry, folks. I wish we could do it. We do, I do want to show you our exit form here really fast. Oh, yes. oh two oh. things. We've got some resources here for you, um, which gives you the NEMIS and Cox standards, some stuff on, on UDL, and a great book on how to personalize learning if you're interested in that. Buy this book. Um, and there's our contact information. Um, and there's our Google form right there, tinyurl.com. FD for friendly disruption, I tap all one word. Um, we'd love it if you give us some feedback. Use those as a, as, as a time to, to fill out the form. It's just those two questions, and then say, hey, if you want to be on a podcast. And then we'll go back to our contact information because sometimes people actually want to reach out to us, and we encourage you to do that. Um, if there's anything that you have questions on or want to keep the conversation yeah. going. Um, hopefully, so as you got something out of this that was interesting, um, we again appreciate you coming in so early in the morning. Just hang around for a couple minutes before we head up to see Buddy. 
Um, by the way, you're in here for Tweet Buddy Barry's uh, uh, delight. Um, a wonderful guy. Uh, I actually went to his summer institute this summer in Eminence, and I, I visited his school. Um, it's worth the trip if you ever get a chance to do that. Um, hang out, we'll have a conversation, we'll go from there. So have a great morning, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.